Michael Bill Stubblefield, the Hall of Famer Matt Miller, and via telephone, Dr. Jessica Ice, Executive Director of West Virginians for Affordable Health Care. Dr. Ice, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for your patience and holding, too. I saw that you called in a little bit early, so I appreciate you hanging out with us during the end of that last I'm segment. always early. Wasn't that <laughs> nice of uh, Mitch Carmichael to transition into our segment here by mentioning affordable health care? Absolutely. I thought it was just uh, perfect. It worked out nicely there. So let's talk about HB 3274, the affordable Medicaid uh, a buy-in bill, and... Uh, first and foremost, I have to presume, Dr. Rice, that this was proposed by the Republican majority in the state legislature. And uh, what are the odds of it passing? Um, we feel fairly confident about getting this through. Um, it's a, it, To us, it's a no-brainer policy solution to a problem that we have in this state. Tell me what the bill would do and who it would affect. Okay, so what this bill would do, let me tell you about the, the problem first. Um, what, what this bill is trying to address is what we call the Medicaid cliff, which is when folks um, work their way up the economic ladder um, and then they become suddenly ineligible for, for Medicaid health insurance, and so they fall off what we call the Medicaid cliff. But perhaps it's too expensive to join um, the marketplace plan um, for insurance. So this this bill would give uh, Medicaid type insurance coverage for for West Virginia workers between 138 percent and 200 percent of the federal poverty level. Currently, um, Medicaid goes up to 138% of the federal poverty level for West Virginians. This would give a similar type of coverage, but up to 200%. Do you know off the top of your head what the federal poverty level is for 2023? It, um, um, well, for a single person, a uh, single person, it would be just under $15,000 a year um, for, you know, say a, a single mom with two kids, it's going to be closer to 25000 a year. Yikes. So anything over that, you don't get covered by Medicaid and uh, health insurance. You would have to get health insurance privately. Well, anything over 138%. So um, for... For like a single person, say that's about just under eighteen thousand mm -hmm. a year. Okay, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning. So uh, I understand what you're trying to do. You're filling the gap, uh, and the proposal from the House Bill thirty-two uh, seventy-four is for a, uh, thirteen to seventeen million dollars of, of funding uh, for the first year. Then after that, it would be that's going to be federal uh, federal money. Then after that, it would be approximately seventeen million dollars state money every year. Is that? Is that the uh, the approximate? Do I have my numbers right for the expenditures? Well, what I'm going to say is this would cost the state uh, zero dollars. It's a no cost option for the state. What it is is taking advantage of what's already written into law under the Affordable Care Act and making it so that West Virginia can pull down this money from the federal government with no cost to the state itself. Okay, so uh, so the first one, as I understand, uh, 2023 is all federal funds. Subsequent to that, it's going to be federal fund, then would go into a state trust fund, which the money would be paid for. Is that correct? Yes, and that okay. would help. What would happen is, you know, because there would be this surplus, and we could – put that surplus into a trust, and it could just sit there to ensure that the program remains stable. So if there are up years, down years, et cetera. But it, it, it really is no cost to the state itself. Okay. And I understand around 40,000 West Virginians would be impacted by this? Yeah. So what 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 commonly happens, um, especially in, in a state like West Virginia, with um, you know construction jobs and tourism jobs is some months are boom and some months are bust 
And so, you know, when workers aren't working and they qualify for Medicaid, but then, you know, the work comes back and they no longer qualified, they're, they're doing this thing that we refer to as churn, which means their, their eligibility for Medicaid comes and goes depending on the season and their work and things like that. So it would kind of soften that blow and ha- like really create a continuity in, in health coverage. Would the uh, individuals be expected to pay anything? Depending on how we, we set it up, um, it could be we would expect that there would be low to no deductibles, um, some moderate co-pays, um, low or very moderate or not at all um, um, <clears throat> premiums it would just depend on how it's set up but it would be it would be a cost sharing type of model but with a significantly lower cost sharing that that's offered on the marketplace matt as i'm looking at uh, some information on this bill itself and you were just talking about the churn and i'm reading the the one paragraph that you know kind of gives you the idea of what that means as to someone that that maybe is on that uh, medicaid because they're in that low time of a work uh, schedule and then as work picks back up they now over qualifiers you say they hit that cliff uh, then it drops off and they may have no coverage and then have to go find coverage P- please tell me how this bill kind of when it fills that gap would they still end up in that moment where there is no coverage or would it keep them on medicaid or completely off medicaid how would it work the, the idea is it would keep a continuity of coverage so um, even if your income increased you weren't automatically kicked off of insurance and having to go search for another coverage um, through the marketplace or elsewhere. And, you know, that means that you can keep your same doctors, your same pharmacy, um, you know, just making sure that you can keep your appointments because it would all be covered this under the same like Medicaid. What type of a sign-up process would there be for those that may say, hey, I, I fit in this, this window and I may need this help? Well, that's to be determined um, whether or not we would offer it on the marketplace or through um, DHHR's um, online system or our navigators. We've got great um, healthcare navigators in the state. They could do it too, but it would it would be signing up and then transitioning into that program. And again, would that be something that would need to be done, say, each year? Or if there's a job change, would it impact those things? Whenever there is a job change or things like that, um, you know, it always can potentially impact um, your health coverage. We know that it would it would make it smoother, a smoother transition. As far as affordable health care in the state of West Virginia, where do we kind of sit or rank as far as other states and and the opportunity for our residents to receive the health care they need? You know, health care is certainly um, a number one or two concern of, of most West Virginians. We rank pretty poorly on health outcomes. I think we're all aware of that. And a lot of that has to do with with coverage and accessibility. Um, Another thing is that, I'm trying to find the words to say, um, another thing, Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. yes. You clicked for a oh, moment, okay. but I think we still have you. About that. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, what was the, Could you remind me of the question? <laughs> I, my phone is acting funny. Sorry. Just, just wondering about where we are at in, in the Mountain State as far as affordable health care for our residents. Oh, okay, yeah. And so if we were to look at our marketplace, um, the the marketplace where you can go and purchase insurance under the Affordable Care Act, we have some of the highest premiums in the entire country um, right now. 
and that's for a variety of reasons, but we do. And so this would, you know, when when folks go on to the marketplace and they're not eligible for Medicaid, but they're not making, you know, hand over fist type of money, they can see the premiums on the marketplace and think, oh, goodness, this is something I cannot afford and and would likely skip um, health insurance altogether if they can't afford it because, you know, you've got to pay for your rent and your your utilities and food before all else, right? Um, let me ask a question about, uh, I'm going to throw a little um, uh, monkey wrench, if you will, into it. I, how much do you, does your organization deal with um, when we talk about affordable health care, uh, like medical sharing type of plans? I know my wife and I, for 20 years now, have not been in what would typically be considered health insurance, but have rather been a part of a medical cooperative or a medical sharing plan. Do you see a lot of that in West Virginia? an interesting question. Actually, um, I don't. I've heard stories from a, a few folks, but really that's not a, a popular option for for most people in, in West Virginia. All right. Picking up on that, if I can, you're with West Virginians for Affordable Health Care. Uh, you're certainly the champions of uh, this affordable Medicare buy-in bill. Uh, if it should pass, what will your role be? Will you be part of the uh, implementation or advisor? What will your role be? Our role, no, our role really is just to identify um, problems in accessing affordable, um, equitable health care and coming up with policy solutions that we think can address those problems. So this policy solution, you know, costs zero dollars for the state of West Virginia, but could potentially help thousands. Uh, have other states implemented a similar uh, Medicare buy-in program? Medicaid. Medicaid, Medicaid, yeah. Medicaid, yeah. yeah. Actually, um, yeah, there have been a couple states that have either done something or looked into it. Um, I think two states have passed it, and we know that even um, our neighbors to the south, Kentucky, has, has been looking at a type of basic health program as well. So it's gaining traction across the country. Dr. Jessica Ice is our guest, Executive Director of West Virginia's for Affordable Health Care, and we've been discussing HB 3274, the Affordable Medicaid Buy-In Bill. And this bill seeks to eliminate the Medicaid cliff at no cost to the state through federal dollars. Dr. Ice, how is this different than the affordable health care portal that you can go on in the state to get your health insurance? Uh, are you speaking of the marketplace? Yes. Or, yeah. Um, what it is, it, it, it likely could be combined with the marketplace. It specifically is targeted to folks who are, um, you know, especially if they're Medicaid eligible and, you know, are climbing this economic ladder. One of the, one of the examples we like to use is, um, and if you'll give me a second here, I'll, I'll sure. explain it, is, um, you know, let's, let's talk about uh, West Virginian, let's call her Mary. She's single, 35-year-old in Ohio County. She makes nine twenty five an hour, and say she's um, um, a gas station attendant, and then she gets the opportunity to be shift supervisor. It comes with a ninety four cent an hour raise, right? So now she's making ten nineteen an hour. Great, right? Except for she goes from being Medicaid eligible to ineligible for Medicaid, and her health insurance costs in the private market shoot up with. You know, from going from zero dollar deductible and co insurance to, you know, a over a thousand dollar deductible, twenty eight hundred dollar out of pocket maximum. So it, it really is this cliff that people have to calculate in their minds. You know, we always say that West Virginians um, they're rational. They know that taking a promotion or accepting a pay raise or something, if they're going to lose their health insurance through Medicaid, they've got to do that calculus in their in their mind and say, is it worth it 
to move up the economic ladder if my health care is in jeopardy. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I guess the question that I was really kind of centering on is, let's say that this bill gets uh, support and passes, and I'm Mary or Mary's son or whatever, and I'm, I'm in the in the job market, but I'm not making a ton of money, and I need health insurance. I go to the marketplace. Will this be an option in the marketplace when I go to try to select medical insurance? We anticipate that that's where it would be offered, um, but there's a, a different ways that the state can offer it. So that would be an administrative decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but there would be a, a trigger, I think, for folks with certain income levels where it would direct them to this option. Well, well, once you were to go to that site, you're saying there would be direction? I would imagine so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Dr. Ice, you said you, you were optimistic this would pass. What would be the downside? As, as I listen to you, I say it's going to cost uh, uh, be, uh, something like forty to 60,000 West Virginians would benefit that fall in this, this gap. It's not going to be any state dollars. It's going to be federal dollars, uh, either direct or in a trust. So what is the downside? Why would the... Why would there be any pushback at all from the legislators? Well, if you're asking me personally, I would say there is no downside, right? Um, I think it's a, a fantastic bill and a fantastic use of federal dollars in our state. Um, you know, I, I, I could imagine some objections, gosh, might be um, – that's a hard one. I, I, I really have a mm-hmm. hard time finding like why it wouldn't pass. Honestly, again, uh, something like forty to sixty thousand of our fellow citizens without any cost at all from the state's perspective. Okay. Yeah, to me, it's a no-brainer. But you know, I'm sure there can be some valid objections. I just haven't heard any good ones yet. Let's put it that way. Yeah, who are the sponsors for the bill? Who are the spot? Well, it was introduced by Worrell, um, Delegate Worrell. Um, we, he introduced actually a version of it last year. Um, and then it now has an additional nine, uh, Republican co-sponsors. So, um, it's, this is a Republican bill in the legislature right now. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea that The federal government is the one that sets these rules and regulations for Medicaid, so they're the ones that create the cliff. And they're telling you now as a state that you have to create a bill and a situation to fix the cliff, and if you do, they'll send you the money so it doesn't even cost you anything. And I'm just wondering, why doesn't the federal government just move the cliff? And they're, they're creating a cliff and then telling you they'll give you money to help fix it as opposed to just fix the cliff, <laughs> change the requirements. Oh, oh. We, would, we would love to see that changed at the federal level. But you know how states are um, incubators of, of policy ideas. I think that part of a compromise from the Affordable Care Act was to allow states to pick and choose certain things, especially when it comes to Medicaid and basic health programs and things of that nature. So they left a lot of the decisions up to the states. And West Virginia was one of the very first states to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Now, this is not a Medicaid expansion. That's different. But it's it still shows that You know, states have this power to either give more or not, um, depending on, you know, the will of of the legislature. By the way, let me point out that uh, delegates Mike Hornby and Mike Height, Mike Hornby, of course, owner of this uh, radio station, and uh, Mike Height, who is also a delegate from our local area, have signed on as co-sponsors to this bill. Uh, which uh, means that they find value in it as well. Dr. Ice, uh, where can our listeners and viewers find out more about HB 3274 and the work that you folks do at West, West Virginians for Affordable Health Care? I, um, I, I can direct you to our website. It's wvahc.org. We have a bunch of fact sheets on this and research 
um, around how this would work and how it could benefit West Virginians. And then I would also encourage listeners to um, call their, their delegates and say, hey, this sounds like a no-brainer to me. We'd like this to see this movie in this, this session. So those are the two places I would say to get involved. Thank you. Dr. Ice, that would be a great name in the next James Bond movie, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it's perfect. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> totally rocks. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Have a great day.